morning. So if you go ahead and begin turning there, Exodus chapter 32. I want to show you something before we get started here this morning. How many of you recognize this? All right. How many of you use this on a pretty regular basis? All right. Nice and easy, right? Nice and quick. Okay. And actually, this is corn muffin. And of course, they do all different kind of flavors, you know, stuff like that. But actually, your know, cornbread's pretty tasty if you do it right. I'll tell you a little story. My wife's already laughing. She knows where I'm going with this this morning. When we kind of first started dating and, and as we were first married, a lot of Sunday afternoons, we would go to Laura's grandparents for lunch after church. And uh, we always had basically the same thing. We had roast beef, which was always good. A little dry because they cooked it forever, you know. It was one of those meats where you started the night before, so you make sure it was done the next morning. So it was about dry by the time we got it. And then also we would have, we called it Hilda rice. Laura's grandmother's name was Hilda. Many of you probably had it. It's rice where you mix in like the Campbell's beef consomme with it, you know, and stuff like that. Kind of turned it brown and stuff. I don't know how many of you had it or not. Really good. Put some butter in it and all that sort of stuff. Everything's good with butter, right? And so we always called it Hilda rice because that's what her grandmother fixed every every Sunday afternoon for lunch when we would go over there. And then they would do Jiffy cornbread. Now, they sort of varied a little. They wouldn't do it like the package said. Laura's grandfather always said, well, it needed some more of flour or some more of this and that. So by the time they cooked it, it was like a rock and it was about that thin. Okay? You think about that this morning, kind of the way a lot of people do with God, is it not? You know, when we understand and accept God for who He is, then life, uh, it's not easy, but it becomes easier to endure. Life becomes more joyful. Christ said when He came to this earth, I've come that you might have life and have it abundant, have it to the full. And that's what God wants for us. But when we start modifying God, or even replacing God with something that we might think is better or something that brings us more immediate satisfaction or immediate pleasure, then life becomes so much more difficult. In the 20th chapter of Exodus, we're given the top 10 commandments that God gave to His people Israel. Moses is up on Mount Sinai. And God had given him the law. God had given him the law so his people would know what God expects for them, the standard that God has set in order for us to be acceptable, in order for us to meet God's holiness and God's righteousness. But y'all know as well as I do what happened. None of the Israelites could reach that standard. None of us could ever reach that standard. None of us could obey the fullness of the law. But God gave Moses the top ten. Now, the first four of those top ten have to do with man's relationship with God. How we relate to God. The last six have to do with man's relationship to man. How we relate to one another. If you've never thought of that before, go back and read those ten commandments sometime and you'll see what I'm talking about. But of the very first two of those top ten commandments, God speaks about how we are to worship Him alone. How we are not to serve or bow down or worship anything else other than the one true God, the Creator God Himself. Let me read to you those first two commandments in Exodus chapter 20, beginning there in verse 3. And here's what it says. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me 
and keep my commandments. So God, the very first two of those top ten commandments, has told us we are not to bow down. We are not to worship. We are not to place anything else in our lives of greater value or of more importance than He is. And so as I said earlier, Moses is up there on Mount Sinai. And he's giving these commandments. God is giving these commandments to Moses. If you go back and read the passage, and this is something, honestly, I did not even think about or realize until just this past week. You know, I've always thought as Moses is up on Mount Sinai, God's speaking out the commandments and wrote, Moses is writing them down on those tablets, right? But if you read the passage, it tells us that God gave the tablets with the commandment. He gave them to Moses up there on Mount Sinai. So Moses is up there on this mountain, and look what happens here in our passage, beginning in verse 32. Before Moses even returns from receiving the law from God, God's people are already breaking those first two commandments. In verse 32, verse, chapter 32, verse 1, it says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, Aaron who was the priest of God's people at the time, and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. And so Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. And he, Aaron, took what they had to him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. He, Aaron, the priest that God has chosen for his people, He's the one that is initiating, instrumental in fulfilling the people's wishes for a God or gods. And then it says, beginning uh, on further. So then they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Well, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Okay, they had their worship service before this calf, before this image. And then it says afterward, they sat down to eat and to drink and got caught up to indulge in revelry. So then the Lord said to Moses, who was still on the mountain this time, Go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt has become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. You know what a stiff-necked person is? A person we would say is dead from the neck up. That's what a stiff-necked person is. And that's what God says about his people. And in verse 10, God says, Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. God's not happy with his people. His people take all the gold that they have in their possession and they make an image, they form an image under Aaron, the priest's direction. And he is huge, instrumental in doing this. It says he fashioned this image with a tool. That's going to become very important a little bit later on. But he fashions this image. And then he says we're going to worship and then tomorrow we're going to have a party. We're going to have a festival. Now, some of you guys can see kind of nod your heads. Like, what a shame. How bad God's people were. <laughs> but you know what? We human beings, even in this day and age, we are just as guilty as the Israelites are. In verse 1, they said, make us a God who will go before us. They want gods, little g, plural, gods, not just one that will lead them. And we human beings, being just as guilty, many times we create our own quote-unquote sacred cows that become more important in our lives. 
more important than God that we ultimately give our devotion to. And those sacred cows, they can be tangible, tangible objects or they can be intangible objects. And what are some examples of those sacred cows that we might set up? And you can probably think of many more than I mentioned. But monetary, material possessions. You know, I, I, I've seen people and I know people, and some of you may know these same type of people, they don't want to get rid of their stuff. They need to hold on to it. They might need it someday. And 50 years down the road, no, I can't get rid of it. I still might need it someday. They like holding on to their stuff. Another example, and basketball players, I didn't put this in here just for y'all this morning. I put it in for all of us. But sometimes our sacred cows become a recreation, or sports, or, or maybe some of you that are, you know, workout fanatics, maybe physical fitness becomes your sacred cow. Another example, time. I like my time. I want to do with my time what I want to do. One more example, relationships. Sometimes relationships in our lives can become our sacred cows. Men, don't refer to your wife as a sacred cow. <laughs> It might not go well with you the rest of the day. <laughs> but sometimes relationships, yes, they can become sacred cows. Even in the church, there are things that become the church's sacred cows. Tom Rainer, who's the president of Lifeway, or used to be, I believe he's retired now, he wrote an article a while back called 15 Common Sacred Cows in the Church. Let me just name you just a few that he mentions. The organ or the piano. You can't have a real church service unless you've got an organ or a piano. And you can't do without them. You've got to have the organ or the piano. Those are the only instruments that should be allowed at a church service. What about the order of worship? It's not a proper worship service unless you follow a specific certain order. You've got to have a welcome. You've got to have the offering in a certain spot. You've got to have the sermon, the message spoken at a certain place in the order. Or something's wrong. You're not doing it right. What about church pews or, or church furnishings? Such as like a pulpit or the Lord's Supper table. <coughs> You know, actually, true story, several years ago when we were renovating the sanctuary, some of you are aware of this, somehow or another rumor got out that we were going to replace all the pews in here. I actually had someone come to my house in tears because they really thought we were getting rid of all the pews. And of course, I said, I don't know where you got that from. <laughs> but literally, they were in tears over it because they thought we were about to do away with the pews. What about clothing? I have heard true stories of churches telling people to leave because they weren't dressed in the way that the members thought they should be. Some of y'all probably heard some of those stories too. What about hair? Talking about clothing, what about hair? Again, I've heard stories. Actually, this happened to my brother-in-law years ago. Church he grew up in. Church he was a member of. His pastor one Sunday told him his hair was too long. And he said, before you come back to church next Sunday, I want you to get a haircut. So for men, sometimes hair too long. For women, sometimes hair too short. So clothing, church committees can become sacred cows in church. <laughs> I love Tom Rainer in this article I mentioned earlier. He sort of took John 3.16 and rephrased it. In this way, for God so loved the world that he did not send a committee. <laughs> Amen. Praise Jesus for that one, right? What about the pastor? Sometimes pastors can become sacred cows. 
That's why so many people will leave a church when their favorite pastor leaves. Today I want to give you real quickly, before we observe the Lord's Supper, I want to look at real quickly three reasons why God will not tolerate our sacred cows or any other object, tangible or intangible, that holds more value or that holds more importance than He does in our life. And the first reason is this. Sacred cows are built from the wrong inspiration. In our passage this morning, what caused the Israelites to build their sacred cow? Well, two things, mainly impatience. Where's Moses? He hadn't come down yet, so let's go ahead and build our own gods so we might worship them. The second reason why they built their sacred cow is perception. They thought Moses had left them. They thought Moses had abandoned them. Moses keeps telling us about this God, this true God who supposedly delivered us from Egypt. Well, where is Moses and where is this God? So Aaron, let's build our own gods. Little G plural. Who will go before us? Who will lead us? There are two phrases in this first verse of this chapter 32 that really struck me. And those two phrases are this. When the people saw, that's one. And the other phrase is, we don't know. The Israelites, they were just too impatient to wait on a word from God through his servant Moses. And they were absolutely completely wrong in their perception that Moses had left them or Moses had abandoned them. How many times do we become impatient with God? How many times will we take matters in our own hands because we feel like we're not getting a word from God, and so therefore we just go out on our own and do what we want to? How many times do our perceptions of what Christianity of what our faith in Jesus Christ, how many times do those perceptions become clouded? Listen to your people this morning. God can still be worshipped regardless of whether there's a piano or whether there's an organ or if there's guitars or if there's drums or if there's no instruments at all whatsoever. God can still be worshipped. God can still be worshipped regardless of the color of the paint. How many times have we heard churches splitting up or breaking up because of the color of paint or the color of carpet? God can still be worshipped regardless of the color of paint or carpet, even if there's no carpet. God can still be worshipped whether it's pews, whether it's chairs, or whether it's dirt ground that we sit on. God can still be worshipped whether there's a pulpit or not. God can still be worshipped even if there is no actual physical building or structure to worship in. God can still be worshipped regardless of whether the Lord's Supper is observed once a quarter or once a month or every single Sunday. But you cannot worship God and man. Scripture actually uses the word serve. Well, isn't that the same thing basically? Part of our service to God is giving our praise and our adoration and our worship to Him. We're told in Scripture that no one can serve two masters. You're either going to hate one and love the other, or you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. It says no one can serve God and money or mammon. It literally says that you cannot be a slave to, you can't be a servant of two things. You can't divide your devotion between two things. God doesn't want our divided devotion. He wants our complete devotion to Him. So our personal sacred cows are those parts of our life to which we are more devoted to than God. And the first thing, the first reason why God will not tolerate them is because they are built from the wrong inspiration. The second reason is this. Sacred cows are built from the wrong focus. Let me ask you a question right now. What are you focused on right now this very moment? Are you focused on some object in this room? Oh, those flowers sure are fruit today. Are you focused on another person sitting here in this room? 
Are you focused on your watch? Are you focused on the back of your eyelids? The people commanded of Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. They wanted a God that was convenient. They wanted a God that they could be comfortable with. They wanted a God that they could control. They wanted to worship where they pleased and when they pleased and how they pleased. In Revelation, we read a passage up in heaven where all the martyrs at one, time, at one point cry out to God, cry out to Jesus, when, O oh Lord, will you avenge the blood that we have shed on behalf of Christ for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? You know, I have to think about that passage and I think, you know, if, if our faith, if our, our relationship with Christ was supposed to be convenient and it was supposed to be comfortable and it was something that we can control, then God all owes all of those martyrs up in heaven a big apology. Bill Hiles, who's the senior pastor at Willow Creek Church in Chicago, Illinois, in his book, Who Are You When No One's Looking, said this, Every single day we make choices that show whether we are courageous or cowardly. We choose between the right thing and the convenient thing. Sticking to a conviction or caving in for the sake of comfort, greed, or approval. We choose either to take a carefully thought out risk or to crawl into a shrinking shell of safety, security, and inactivity. We choose either to believe in God and trust Him even when we do not always understand His ways, or to second-guess Him and cower in the corners of doubt and fear. See, some people's faith focus, I'm calling it, only requires one hour a week. Some people's faith focus doesn't require them to tithe. Some people's faith focus doesn't require them to change any type of behavior. Some people's faith focus doesn't even require them to share their faith. Some people's faith focus doesn't require them to do anything but to come and sit on Sunday morning. See, sacred cows are built from the wrong inspiration and also the wrong focus. And here's the last reason. Sacred cows will always lead to the wrong outcome. If we looked at our passage this morning, what were some of the wrong outcomes that came out of them building this image of this calf? Well, the first wrong outcome, it was empty worship. See, worship of a cold and dead and lifeless object will lead to a cold and dead and lifeless worship. See, God created us for a meaningful personal, intimate, close relationship with Him. He did not create people to honor or to observe a cold, dead, and lifeless religion. The second wrong outcome was just an inappropriate lifestyle. Now this may seem strange to quote this person this morning, but Napoleon Bonaparte once said, if Socrates entered the room, we should rise and do him honor. If Jesus Christ entered the room, we should fall down on our knees and worship him. See, entering into a true relationship with Jesus Christ and true worship of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that should truly be a real life-changing experience. The last wrong outcome was false testimony. I can't help but laugh when Moses comes down off of that mountain. And of course, God's already told him what's happened. And he goes to Aaron, the priest, again. And he asks Aaron, why did you allow the people to do this? Listen to Aaron's excuse. Listen to Aaron's reasoning here. Aaron says, they said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So Aaron says, I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. So then they gave me the gold. I threw it into the fire and poof, I popped this golden image. That's what Aaron said. 
That's false testimony. <laughs> we read earlier how Aaron led the charge. He even fashioned this image out of tools himself. But his line to Moses was, I threw all that gold in the fire and out popped this image. At least a false testimony. I heard it said that most people tend to worship their work, work in their play, and play in their worship. Let me read that again. Most people tend to worship their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. For many who profess to be believers, and it's sad to say, it's really no more than gaining heaven and avoiding hell. In verse 6 of our passage this morning, again, it said, The next day they got up and this image was created. Rose early, they offered sacrifices, burnt offerings, presented fellowship offerings to this image. And they couldn't wait to get that done because then afterwards... They sat down to eat and drink, and they got up to indulge in revelry. You see, their worship was not a true life-changing experience because it was a worship of an inanimate, lifeless object that could do them no good whatsoever. But it was a worship. It was a God, little G, that they could control, that they could be comfortable with, and they could still live their life however they wanted to. See, their sacred cows were things of this world that's only temporary and only fading away. And whatever sacred cows we may have in our lives today, those sacred cows are just nothing but things of this world that are fading away that will one day be destroyed. And what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his very soul? So sacred cows are built from wrong inspiration. They're built from wrong focus. And they always lead to a wrong outcome. Look at how Moses took care of this image. The sacred cow in verse 20. It says he took the calf they had made and he burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to a powder, scattered it on the water, and he made the Israelites drink it. <laughs> took that image ground it up to a powder, threw it in the water, mixed it up, and said, okay, here, God's people, drink what you created. I bet that left a horrible, nasty taste in their mouth. And you know what sacred cows will do? They will always leave a bad taste in our lives. Rightfully so. Nothing good comes from giving devotion, our devotion to anything or anyone other than God Almighty Himself through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ His Son. So what sacred cows do you have in your life that are really devoted to God? What sacred cows do you need to do like Moses and need to smash and grind up and destroy that are hindering you from being fully devoted to your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? 